While you're turning there, Genesis chapter 22 and Ruth chapter 4, I want to tell you two stories about God opportunities, two separate stories. The first one is about Henry Blackaby. He is the founder, president, emeritus of an organization called Experiencing God. And of course, he's well-known author for that book and that study, Experiencing God, so most people recognize his name. But one time, Henry Blackaby visited Africa, and as he was there, one of the pastors there came to him and asked him to do him a favor. He had, this pastor had such a burden on his heart for all the children who were without parents because of AIDS. And these kids had AIDS too. Go back to the States, go to the African American churches in the States and ask them to get involved, to come over here and help and get involved with this AIDS epidemic of children without parents. And Blackaby thought about it for a while and he was pretty nervous because he didn't have a lot of ties with these bigger African American churches. And so he just began to pray about it. But as he began to pray about it, God laid something on his heart. Funny how that happens. And so just a day and a half after he got back to the States, one and a half days, by mere coincidence, one of the largest African American churches in America called Henry Blackaby and said, Here's what's going on. We have this coalition of African American churches coming together and we would like you to be the keynote speaker at that talk. Would you do it? Just a coincidence. From there, he met several people and was actually invited to the United Nations to speak before presidents and kings. Henry Blackaby accepted that invitation and from there he met with many presidents, many nations and invited them to join this work that was going on in Africa. All right, so that's story number one. Story number two is about a guy that a lot of us have heard about. His name is Dwight Moody. How many people have heard of Dwight Moody? Famous evangelist, right? Well, on October 8, 1871, Dwight Moody was wrapping up one of these evangelistic conferences he had and he began to think and he said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I don't want to put people on the spot today. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to give an altar call and instead I'm going to give them one week to come back next week and think about what it costs to follow Jesus Christ. So he gave no altar call. He dismissed them and just as he's dismissing the people, the city fire bells began to ring. Not many people thought much of it until we know now that that was that great Chicago city fire where many people died. Thousands of people died. All of his life's work was chewed up by the fire and all these people went home. After securing his family and getting them all safe, he finally said, God I fully commit my heart to you. And I will never, ever, ever again miss an opportunity to ask people to commit to Jesus Christ at the end of one of my events. I will never do that again. A lot of people thought that was a missed opportunity. That was pretty tough. This is what Dwight Moody himself said later. He said, I learned a lesson that night that, which I've never forgotten. When I preach... I will try to bring people to a decision on the spot. I would rather have my right hand cut off than to give an audience a week to think about following Jesus Christ. Now we've been going through the book of Ruth and we've been talking about God's providence for weeks now and I want to remind you where we left off in our story. Ruth went down to the threshing floor to lay at Boaz's feet and has this conversation with Boaz about becoming her kinsman redeemer and marrying her. Boaz didn't want anyone to know that Ruth had spent the night there because nothing inappropriate happened, and you know how people believe and think. So he gives her a bunch of grain in the morning to take back to Naomi, and finally, Naomi encouraged her daughter-in-law, wait patiently until Boaz does the right thing. We learned, our main point last week, was that God expects us to wait patiently for him as well. But, the moment he reveals his plans to us, we are to get up, move out, and go do it. That's what we learned from last week. So as a review, if your Bibles are open, chapter 3, look at verse 11 for just a moment. It says, And now, my daughter, do not fear. 
I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative, however, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform that duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So that's where we pick back up our story. And we're going to see some legal negotiations, number one there in your notes. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Notice what he said. I'll do it. That other relative said, I will do it. So Boaz goes before the city gates, and, and for our culture, we go, why the city gates? Well, what's the deal there? We've got to understand, this is like city hall in their day. That's where all the business and all the legal negotiations took place, was right there at the city gate. And, and so city hall, the city officials, the represented elders there at the city gates, and, and Boaz needed these elders to be there during the negotiations so that it wasn't his word versus this other relative's. This was official business. There in your notes. In a typical Middle Eastern style, Boaz laid out some attractive bait to his relative. See what Boaz does. I love this. They all wanted land. There's not a one of them that didn't want extra land. So what Boaz says is, hey, check this out. Elimelech had some land that Naomi has. So will you buy it back? Obviously, they must have sold it before she went over to Moab. And he's like... Yeah, I'll do it. It's hook and bait. He's bringing them in. He didn't tell them about Ruth at first. He just tells them about that. And then Boaz says, Oh, by the way, that's kind of like saying, I'm sorry, but. When you say, oh, by the way, that means everything I said means nothing. Here comes the truth. Look at verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi... You must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Oh, no. Little side note there. There in your notes. Whoever married Ruth and received Naomi's land would have to pass the land on to Ruth's children. You understand? This land was going to stay with Ruth's children and grandchildren, and on it went. So you're not going to get to mix your land with this land and give it to your children. This is going to Ruth's children. That's not what this relative wanted. He wasn't interested at all. He didn't want to mix the inheritances. But to me, this is a short-sighted decision. Look at verse 6. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Wait a minute, you just said you could. I cannot do it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So I got to thinking, and I said, why doesn't this guy want to marry Ruth? What seems to be the problem here? And, and in fact, Jim and I were in my office on Thursday, and we were talking about this very thing. Why didn't he want to marry Ruth? So the first Obvious answer is maybe it's because it's a mixed marriage, right? She's a Moabitess. And the law told them not to marry a Gentile. That excuse doesn't fly, however. She's already been intermarried. Now she's already in the clan, right? The law told him to redeem her. So that one doesn't fly. Maybe he's already married and didn't want a plural marriage situation. After all, Solomon had a thousand wives. They said he was really smart. 
I take issue with that. Sandra is all the woman I will ever need. <laughs> Maybe it was pride, prejudice, fear, right? I don't want her. But whatever the reason, I think it was a short-sighted decision. There in your notes, this relative missed out on God's blessing because he would not fulfill the duty which was laid out for him in God's plan. When the close relative heard the conditions and Ruth was included, he said, no, thank you. And I wonder how many of us miss out on God's blessings for some of the same reasons. God tells us to move, go, I got this laid out for you, and we get scared. Am I the only one? Got quiet in here. I can't tell you how many times God has told me to do something and that I have shrunk back in fear and thought, now I'm kind of a rational guy, right? I take everything to its logical conclusion. I'm one of these finisher guys who, who I look at the worst case scenario and that's what's going to happen. And so I think, but God, if I do this, 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 and this is going to happen. And God said, I didn't ask you to think about any of those things, Rich. I told you to move. B -b but God. So you don't understand, God. This could happen. That could happen. Deep down, some of us don't follow God's plans for our lives, honestly, because His plans interrupt our plans. I heard a couple of you moan, so some of us are in the same boat together. Now, I, I think to myself, how many of us would love to back up in time and change something we either did or said in the past? How, let me see a show of hands. How many of us would like to change something about our past? The rest of you, you, you can see me after service for lying. When I start going down that road in my mind, however, I think, okay, if I could only back up seven years and not make that one decision seven years ago, true story, man, where would I be? But if I'm going to do that, let's back up 15 years ago and let's change that instead. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's back up to nine years old that first time when in total rebellion I started using drugs. Let's do that. Forget that. Let's back up even a little further. Let's back up to the moment of conception. Because after all, it's my parents' fault, right? I want to share a story with you that should give us hope out of the Old Testament about one of God's men who really blew it. He really blew it. His name was Moses. Maybe you've heard of Moses. He's a pretty famous guy. You remember the story about him and the rock? When the children of Israel were wandering through the desert, they began to complain about lack of water. They complained, they complained, they complained. And if I was Moses, by the way, I wouldn't have been so grace-filled. But Moses praised God and God told him in Exodus 17, 6, I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out for the people to drink. Fast forward in the story, probably 12 hours or so, and the children of Israel begin to complain again. Thank God we're nothing like them. So they begin to complain again about water. And Moses again prays to the Lord, and this is what it says in Numbers 20, verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, there in your notes, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the communities, so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he was commanded, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must I bring water out of this rock again? Then Moses raised his arm up and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. That may not sound too bad, but let's talk about the consequence of Moses doing it 
the way God told him not to. The consequence, verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I've given them. How many consequences have we suffered for the wrong moves that we've made after God told us how to do something? Man, I hate that. You see, here was the problem. God was trying to point a picture. Let me paint this picture for you folks. That rock may have just seemed like a rock to you, but that rock represented Jesus Christ. Follow the word picture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses into the cloud and into the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, that's manna, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ needed to be struck for our sins one time, there in your notes. Afterwards, we simply need to speak to the rock. It's all about relationship. Think about this. Moses, go smite the rock. That's my son, Jesus Christ. Trying to paint a picture here for you. And Moses goes and he smacks the rock. After that, Moses, all you need to do is speak. When Moses... Hit that rock two times. He was dishonoring God. He wasn't trusting Him for one and for two. He was misrepresenting God. Hebrews 9.28 Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. One time. If you truly, with all your heart, receive Jesus Christ, He forgives your sins, past, present, and future. That doesn't mean we don't keep short accounts, folks. Don't get me wrong. We do. But forgiveness, just one drop, just one drop, was enough. When confession is made, according, according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Confession for the believer is simply agreeing with God. We didn't do things His way. David said, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. Confession is made. Forgiveness is a one-time thing after that we speak. Moses misrepresented God's character, and because of that, he lost the right picture of this. Moses goes and gets the children out of Egypt. He brings them out to the desert and because of that one act, really God, one act, he cannot take the children into the promised land. What a cost. Man, could you imagine just for a minute putting up with those children and then forfeiting the right because you wouldn't trust God? Man, that would have broke my heart. Moses probably said, oh God, if I only knew, if I only realized what consequence it was, I would have done it your way. You ever told God that? I have. I would have cried out to you to help me with my anger. God, I would have never done that. I would have never misrepresented your glory. If I could only go back and do it again. But the problem is, folks, we can't. You can't go back. You can't take words back. I think of the word picture that that a wise man once showed me. He took a two-by-four and he had me nail nails all through it. He said, now pull the nails. You were able to pull the nails, right? But you can't remove the holes. You can't take things back. Now praise God, though. (laughs) Here's the butt of the Bible. I love the Bible when it has buts. But God, who is rich in mercy and His love and grace towards us, has forgiven us. 
And even in our dumb mistakes, He promises, I'll cause all things to work together for your good. Because I love you. Amen? David reminds us of that in Psalms 103 when he says, Lord, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed my sin from you. Remember who David was, the adulterer, murderer, and yet he was called a man after God's own heart. We need to lean on the Holy Spirit to keep short accounts and do what He says. Here's the thing. We miss the blessings when we don't obey. God doesn't tell us to obey because He's some cop in the sky that says, I said so. No, He says, look, I see your future. Please go this way. It's the way to blessing. No, God, I'm going my way. And we fall on our face and we go, why God? I must be the only one again. Let's go on. A confirmed commitment, number three. Look at verse seven. It says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man would take off his sandal and give it to another. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all of the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought back all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and his possession at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make this woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephratat and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord gave you from this young woman, will give you from this young woman. So the significance, take off your sandal, it's a confirmation of, of a vow. It's a confirmation of a sale. And, and, and it's kind of like a humility. Taking your shoe off. It's kind of like humbling yourself and saying it is so. Now practically we know Jesus Christ became a servant for us. He's the best example of giving up your rights. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. A little louder. I can't hear them pages. There you go. In chapter 22, we have a story of another famous biblical character named Abraham. We've been studying him in, in Sunday school, adult Sunday school, for the past several weeks. And Abraham, I love him. And this is the story where he's called to sacrifice something that's dear to him. Genesis chapter 22, look at verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice on one of the mountains of which I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Notice, we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on his Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Think about this story. The son of promise that Abraham waited till he was 100 years old to have. This son that God promised him. God says, now let me see how your faith works. Take that promise of mine, put it on the fire. 
Abraham obeyed God so much that he figured, if God provided this son to me at 100 years old, and he said that the bloodline was going to come through him, even if God kills him, he must be able to ri raise him back from the dead because he made a promise and he's going to stick to it. That's faith right there, folks. That is faith. Taking off our shoes symbolically. As a Christ follower, we should risk whatever it takes. Take whatever risk the Lord asks us to do. Think about that for just a second. The promise that you waited years and years and years for, only to get it in your hand and God say, now burn it. Can you do it? I mean, it's easy to say in church, yeah, we do it. It's really easy to say. But God's saying, look, take the risk. Do what I tell you. Listen. He doesn't need you. He can use a donkey. He can use a herd of pigs. We get blessed by obedience. I know obedience is one of them filthy words, especially in our culture today. Obey me. It's like submission. Right, ladies? <laughs> we hate those words. But they're for our blessing. He says, do what I tell you. Take your shoes off. You're standing before the holy God of Israel. Practically, how does that look? What things of the world would God say take off? What if God told you today, and I don't want to hear anything out of you, Sandra. What if God told you today, get rid of your television. That's what I want you to put off today. Could you do it? Be tough. Okay. What if God told you to take hunting and quit it? I love putting guys on the spot like that. But think about it. If God tells you to stop something, He's not an ogre. He wants good things for you. But He wants to be number one in your life. And He's saying, hey, those things you've put before me, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. Let's move on. I've meddled enough. Number four, Jesus' family tree. Look at verse 13 back there in Ruth. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has bore him. Then Naomi took the child, lay him on her bosom, and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Herzon, Herzon begot Ram, and Ram Amimadad, and Amimadad Nashon, and Nashon Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz Obed. Obed begot Jesse and Jesse David. Now that sounds like a lot. And when you start reading genealogies in the Bible, usually I just go, and Bob begot Bob and Bob and Bob. But listen to Matthew chapter 1. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed, Jesse, and Jesse, David the king. By the way, Jesse was who? The great grandfather of Jesus Christ. You remember who Rahab was? I love this. You legalist out there, you better close your ears because it's about to get Western in here. <laughs> Rahab was a harlot, a prostitute in Jericho. She's referred to seven times in Scripture as a prostitute. You can read Joshua chapter 2. I won't go into it. But there at the end of Joshua chapter 2, She's talking to them in verse 11. It says, When we heard of it, our hearts melted. Everyone's courage fell because of you. 
For the Lord your God, listen, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Rahab made a public profession of who God was. And God takes this prostitute and puts her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. What? Rahab and the lives of her family were spared because of her obedience to God. There in your notes, Hebrews 11.31, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with their disobedience. God spares this woman. And then takes a Gentile woman, takes a prostitute Rahab, puts him right in the lineage of Jesus Christ. What kind of grace is that? What kind of God do you serve this morning? If a prostitute walked through the doors this morning and walked up and said, God, forgive me, here I am. I tell you, she is, walks away more forgiven than the guy that stands up and says, I thank you, Lord, I'm not like her. Does that hurt? What kind of grace is this? What kind of plan did God have for her? So let's get practical really quickly as we end. Number one, Ruth is an example of faith in God and loyalty to people who love Him. She left her family, becomes a foreigner, and goes and takes care of her mother-in-law. Faith in God. Love towards His people. Number two, Boaz is an example of integrity, respect, and compassion. We see that in the treatment of his workers, in the treatment of Ruth, Naomi, the negotiation with his relative, everything he does, respect. Number three, God extends his covenant of grace to the Gentiles. Think about this. One more time. A Gentile woman and a prostitute. I love the Bible. I love it because it's so honest. Who, what moron in his right mind would make a religion? Point out the mistakes of Abraham, the cheating ways of David, Rahab the prostitute, Ruth the Moabitess. Who makes a religion up like this? And then Romans says, hey, listen, these were written for your learning, that you can read these and have hope. When you think you've sinned just a little too far for God to love you, you have not. As long as you've got air in your lungs, as long as your heart is still beating, it is not too late to you to turn to the God of heaven for forgiveness. That's good news, by the way. Say amen. So we need to be like Henry Blackaby. He prayed about what was offered to him, and God began to burden his heart. And a day and a half later, by coincidence, yeah, the phone rings. He's invited, and he takes God at his word. Amazing stuff. So how about us? Where do we step out? Where's God calling you to step out? You know, I love when people say, but I can't speak. Either could Moses. But I can't share. Oh, yes, you can. Check it out. If you once was this, and you now is this, you have what I like to call a testimony. The best way to tell people about Jesus Christ is to tell them what you was and what you is. It's called a testimony. That's the best way. You don't need to judge them. You don't need to tell them about their sin. Let me tell you a little secret. Everyone knows they're sinning. God's got this, this part of Him called the Holy Spirit that He sends to convict and convince and draw all men. That's not your job. Your job is to tell them how you have good news. And finally, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus offers us eternal life. He offers us eternal life, and he's saying to all of you who don't have it, come. And by the way, that's an offer too good to pass up. I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> Let's 
my wife shakes her head. <laughs> so every morning, you know, we, we like to give an opportunity for people to respond. Because I don't know what God's doing in your life. I know what God did in my life this week. I got the scars to prove it. But I don't know what God did in your life this week. And some of us have come in here. I'd say all of us came in here needing something. And, and it's not that my prayers or the elders' prayers are any better than your prayers. But you know what? It's so neat to have someone agree with you in prayer. So this morning, if you came in needing, maybe, maybe you need something for health. Maybe you need something financially. Maybe, just maybe, you need salvation this morning. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, my Bible says that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who's in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you. So maybe someone's in here this morning saying, you know, I've never done what Abigail has done and made that confession to salvation. By the way, the water just confirmed it publicly, right? That didn't save her, right? Okay, let's just make that straight. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithclamath.com. Make sure, if you haven't already, to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.